Good morning, good morning, good morning. I'm Erica Allen. I'm one of the pastors here at Horizon Church. And um, I just want to ask you guys something. Do you know what you need? Do you know what you need? We think we know what we need so often, right? Hey, Chris, can you grab that table for me? One of the Chris's, uh, like 12 people get up because there's a lot of Chris's around here. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, we often think we know what we need. Safety, security, right? Peace of mind, strong finances, uh, the perfect dog, the perfect boyfriend, just kidding, uh, perfect girlfriend, the perfect vacation, the perfect job, the perfect kids headed straight to Harvard, preferably, right? We think we know what we need. And we often live our lives as if God has no idea what we actually need. That's how I live my life. I won't tell you all the examples this week. But we so often think we know exactly what we need and we live our lives like God has no clue what we actually need in our lives. And the truth is, if you don't hear anything else I say this morning, I need you to hear this. God knows exactly what you need. And this season of celebrating that Jesus came to earth as a baby and then gave up his life for us after growing up for 33 years teaches us this deep truth. Listen to me. Waiting with God for his promises, for what we actually need to come true, is always worth it. Waiting with God for his promises to come true is always worth it. When I was in college, I went through a pretty terrible breakup with a guy, um, and I was with my roommate, and I, it was obvious I was like having a really bad week, and my roommate named Laura said, Erica, I think you might need to go home for the weekend, and I said, all right, I think I'm just going to pack up my stuff and go home, and she said, I'll go with you. I would love to ride home with you. I have heard so much about Sandy Ridge, cows, your grandma and your grandpa, a garden. Like, I would love to come home with you um, if you're, if you're going to go home. I would love to feed the cows with your grandpa, hang out with your grandmother. And I looked at her and I said, you know what, Laura, I, I've been through hard things in my life before and all I need is a bite of my Mima's biscuits. That's all I need right now. In the midst of this hurt and this pain and this brokenness, all I need is some of my Mima's biscuits. Now, let me tell y'all, I knew what I needed. And God knew what I needed when he made me the granddaughter of Temple Shelton. Because that woman can fix biscuits that fix anything that ails you. They are, they are laid in, in butter. They are then covered on top with butter. They are perfect, flaky in the middle, warm, like thick and gooey. I have the recipe. I've made them. There may be some people in this room who are like, Erica, something's bothering me and I need some biscuits. That is just what these biscuits are for. They are created to help you go through whatever it is that ails you. A little bit of honey, sometimes some molasses, a little more butter, right? It is exactly what I knew I needed to get through the pain and brokenness of this breakup. There is no boy, there is no boy that can keep you from the goodness of God and away from your grandma's biscuits fixing everything in your life. So we got in the car from the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. We drove two and a half hours home to Sandy Ridge, North Carolina, and we hung out with my grandma and grandpa on a Friday afternoon. As soon as we got there, I said, Mima, I need some of your biscuits. She said, oh, honey, I knew what you were coming home for. I knew exactly what you were coming home for. And my grandpa looked at my roommate, Laura, and said, hey, I need to feed the cows. Do y'all want to go with me? Why don't you, Laura, why don't you come with me to feed the cows? Erica, you can stay here and make biscuits with Temple. As soon as they left, my, grandpa, my grandma, my Mima, told me, she said, she patted her kitchen counter, she said, sit right here, like I'd done since I was three years old. When my mom and dad went through their divorce, I sat on that counter, and I asked her all kinds of questions as she made the biscuits. When I was in fourth grade and my best friend decided she didn't want to be my friend anymore, my nine-year-old self sat right there on that counter and watched my grandma make biscuits. When I was 16 and had a bad car accident and didn't want to tell my mom about it, but I knew she was going to find out about it, and I was scared and I didn't want to get in the car again, my grandma, my 16-year-old teenage body self, she said, sit, 
patted that kitchen counter, sit right here. When my beloved aunt passed away and we were both super sad, she said, sit, sit right here and let's make some biscuits. My grandma always told me what she was doing. She's made biscuits for 77 years of her life and she always told me, she always told me what she was doing. First, I'm going to put the lard in. It's like Crisco, but it comes from Honks. It's called lard. It's, it's fine. Bis these biscuits are terrible for you, okay? <laughs> so I have to run half marathons now. Uh, so anyway, she puts the lard in, mixes it up with the, with the flour, and then pours the buttermilk in, and she mixes it with her hand because you have to feel it, right? That's what she'd tell me as she mixes it up. You have to feel it. And then she'd knead it with her hands. She'd just keep putting that air in those pockets in as she kneaded the biscuits. And then she'd roll them out. Um, and then we'd, we'd cut them. She'd always say, Erica, you cut the biscuits. Since I was three years old, I helped her cut the biscuits. And I'd cut those biscuits and we'd lay them in that pan covered with butter. And then she'd say, Erica, you can put the butter on top. And I'd get to spread the butter on top and we'd put them in and we'd cook those biscuits and then we'd eat them. And I sat on that counter as she told me how she made biscuits for the 900th time in my life. And she said, what is it? What is it that hurts so bad about this? And I said, Mima, I thought I was going to marry this guy. I have no idea what the future is going to look like. And she said, oh, honey, just eat a biscuit and we'll figure out what's next. I tell you this story because when Laura sat down in the truck with my grandpa, she told me later that night after we'd ate biscuits and the dinner with, with them, and we were headed back to my house. We were sleeping with my mom and dad, at, uh, my mom and stepdad at, at our house, and we were headed back. And, and Laura looked at me and she said, Eric, I just, I just got to tell you something. She got choked up. She said, I've never seen a family like this. I've never seen a family like this. She said, the second I sat down in your grandpa's truck, he didn't start the truck yet. He looked at me and he said, thank you. Thank you for going with me to feed the cows because Erica thinks what she needs is a bite of her grandma's biscuits. But what she needed is to make the biscuits with Temple. She needed to make the biscuits with Temple. And she, she got choked up as she, she told me that. She said, so often, Erica, we think what, we know what we need, but your grandma knew you didn't need the biscuits. You needed some time to make the biscuits with her. Some of you, some of you have told God, all I need is this, make it happen. Just make the biscuits. And God is inviting us this morning through the story of Jesus. God is inviting us to be a part of making the biscuits. To be a part of making his light real in the world. And somehow, even in the midst of our darkness and pain and brokenness, where we can see no way forward, somehow when we join in with God to make the biscuits, we make the light in the world, the light takes root in our soul and begins to light up our way. This morning, you might know what you need, but God knows what you need and is inviting you to be a part of making the biscuits. In John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, you all have heard these verses before. You, many of you have seen them plastered on the uh, eye black of Tim Tebow, right? Well, not the words, just the verse. You know this verse, but I want you to hear it in the context of Christmas. I want you to hear it as if it's told by a person who doesn't yet know about the cross and the resurrection. I want you to hear it as somebody who only knows that we were given a baby, not a 30-year-old ready to save the world like they'd been promised, not a, not a military ruler or dictator, not a CEO or a business person, not the perfect finance or job or government that we expected, but as people who were given a baby. I want you to listen to these words. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, a baby, wrapped in swaddling clothes, laid in a manger, that whoever believes in him, whoever believes that God could use a baby to save the entire world, we won't perish. 
We will not be circumstance to every breakup and financial ruin and, and painful thing and painful circumstance in our life. We will not perish because of the pain and brokenness of the world, but we will have eternal and bright life. For God did not send this son. He did not give this baby in the, into the world to condemn it. God didn't give this in here to say, you deserved that breakup. You deserved that financial ruin. You deserved that being fired and terminated from your job. That's not why God sent his son into the world, but to save us from all of that mess in the first place. Can I get an amen? Thank you, God, for loving the world so much that you gave us Jesus. It is an example of God's love. It is given for us and the whole world. Given, right? God didn't just wait up in the sky and then boom, poof, like the magic dragon saved the whole world. No, he gave it to us and there was a process of saving us. There was a process of showing us how to love and to be loved. It was given for us. This gift was given for us and the whole entire world. That person you can't stand, I'm sorry, but a little baby Jesus was sent to this world to save them too. That boss that started a, a making your life miserable, that coworker who's lied about you, that wife who's driving you nuts, those kids who don't listen, God gave his son to all of the world so that we won't be condemned, but we'll be saved from all of the things that are destroying us. God's love is given, actively given to us every single day. It is active and it is alive, and this story tells us that. This baby was given to a, a mom, a teenage girl who had no idea that she'd be good for anything in the world. Women were second-class citizens. And she was told, you will give birth to the Savior of the world. It was at an active process. She carried this baby for nine months. She prayed for it and prayed that, that her job in this would bring salvation and redemption and restoration to the whole world. There was a dad... Who, who was a carpenter and could hardly believe or see what he might be able to offer to the world. And that baby was given for him and the whole world. It was active and alive. There were cousins and priests and shepherds lit, watching their flock by night. You want to talk about somebody who has a terrible job? Be a shepherd who has to sleep out in the middle of a field with a bunch of things wolves love, right? And there's one thing between the wolf and the sheep, and it's you. Do you want to, do, who wants that job? Don't complain about the job you're going to tomorrow morning, all right? I'm kidding, I'm kidding. You get to complain if you, if you want to. But this is the world that Jesus was born into. This is the world that God loved so much. He gave us that. Your story matters. Mary being a teenager in the middle of a, a terrible sort of situation, that matters because God through Jesus give, is given active and, and alive love. A woman, a cousin of Mary's who wouldn't, was not able to have a baby for years and years and years is suddenly given the opportunity to be pregnant and have a baby, John the Baptist, who would prepare the way for Jesus. Her story of infertility and pain and hoping and longing, it mattered. A dad who was a carpenter and, and wasn't even sure if he wanted to go through with this marriage. It, it, it mattered. Waiting and being a part of the promises of God matters and it's worth it. Mary was able to see the beauty and redemption of God through a baby and then through her son who grew up. Her story mattered. Elizabeth's story mattered. The shepherds watching over their flocks in the middle of the night, their story mattered. Wise men who came to say King Herod will not have the last word, but God will through Jesus. Their story mattered. It mattered that they spent years studying in school to be astronomers and scientists and, and these wise and, and bright people. And they said, guys, God is doing something new through this baby and it's worth it. Let's figure out how to be a part of it. Every single ounce, atom, every single little quantum piece of this story is pointing to a God whose love is alive and active as we wait for the fullness of God's promise to be made true. And the same is true for your story. No part of it 
No part of it will be beyond the redemption that a little baby given to the world can't change. Your story matters, for God so loved the entire broken, dark, hurting world. God's love, for God so loved the world, that love can be trusted. Every opportunity not to believe was before the people. These shepherds are out in the field and it's like a bright light and an angel talking to them. There was every reason not to believe. Uh, Mary, Joseph, like he had every reason to believe this story was a little shady, right? Every single person in this story had an opportunity to not believe that God was actively doing something in the world. There are lots of reasons for us right now to believe that God is not working in the world. I mean, look at it. Look at your lives. Some of you are like, you have no idea what I dealt with the last month. There are lots of reasons for us to believe God is not working in the world. But God worked in unexpected ways. God's love for the whole world can be trusted. I've sat with men on death row. I've sat with women in prison, some of whom were there for circumstances way beyond their controls. I've sat with mothers who were living in public housing. I've sat with people addicted to drugs and alcohol. I've sat with cancer patients. I've sat with anxious and overwhelmed people. I've held the hands of young adults who were slipping away into eternal life because of cancer. I've sat with myself and the things that I have struggled with and the darkness and pain and brokenness of my own life. And I promise you, I would not get up here every morning and set that screen up and deal with this sound system and figure out how to keep my kids busy and then clean it all up if I didn't believe that the world will absolutely be changed because of Jesus coming into the world as a baby, showing us how to love, how to live, and how to be different, and then dying on a cross and raising again, believing in Jesus, believing that he is a gift of love to the entire world, changes everything, and the things that try to make us perish and take power from our lives, they lose in the face of Jesus. I've sat with people who that's all they had to cling to, and I've watched it change. I know there are people in this room who have every reason not to believe. Pastors aren't supposed to say that. You have reasons not to believe. But believing in Jesus as a gift of love actually saves us from the power of the things that try to make us perish. And God's love always saves us in the unexpected ways. God's love always saves us in the most unexpected ways. Ways. We think we know what we need. Herod, part of this story, right? Herod was a king. He finds out about the birth of Jesus. He hears from everybody around him, this, this little boy is going to grow up and be a king and start a new kingdom. And Herod's like, great, I've got a way to keep being in power. I'll kill all the boys in the entire world. This will help me keep my power. He thought he knew what he needed. When what Herod really needed was just a good dose of, of accepting the love and the gift that God had to offer through Jesus, right? Joseph thought he needed freedom from a trial. I'll just like quietly dismiss Mary as my, as my betrothed. That's the word they use. That means engaged. That is an interesting word, betrothed. Um, Joseph's like, I'm going to have freedom from this whole mess of things. And he believes instead in an angel who says this gift of love is going to change everything. And Joseph says, I don't know, but I have nothing else to believe in this world of pain and brokenness. I have nothing else to believe that, but that maybe you'll be right, God. And so he takes and protects Mary and finds her a place to give birth to this baby. The shepherds, I mean, they had reasons to not believe that anything good was going to happen in their lives. They, they thought they knew what they needed, but what they got was good news from an angel in the sky, a bright light, who said, go and worship this baby and it'll change everything. And they went and told the whole world, we believe in the gift of love that God has given through a baby and it's going to change everything. 
This morning, many of you think you know what you need. And God's love is saving us in the most unexpected ways. The woman, Clarissa, who just stood up here and sang about, Come all you unfaithful. Come all of you that are having doubts and pain and heartache and brokenness and who can barely take one step into church anymore. Come, for Christ is born for you. God's gift of love is for you. The woman who stood up here and sang this ran from this church and the goodness of God for years. I love her. But she ran from it hard. She said, I, I can't sing a have y'all heard her sing? She said, I can't sing. Yes, you can. I just don't, I don't have time for this in my life. I, I think I need to start a business. I think I need to focus on my career. I think I need to figure out relationship stuff. I've got all this stuff that I need to be perfect in my life before I come to lead worship at Horizon Church. So I went and got her sister. And I said, Chrislyn... <laughs> I'm going to need you to come sing at my church so we can get Clarissa in here. She said, I'm, I'm all in. I'm all in. My, my husband wants to be baptized. He's decided to follow Jesus. We're going to be a part of your church. And then guess what? <laughs> Unexpected ways. <laughs> Crystalyn stands up here and sings every week about a God who chases after us in unexpected ways. A God who will never let us go. A God who believes you are worth a baby and a cross and a resurrection. And that if we believe in his power and his love to change everything and make it different in our world and in our lives, if we believe, we will not perish. The things that threaten to destroy us and break us down, they will not perish. And he did it first, not through a cross and not through a resurrection. The first way that God showed us this was through a little, teeny, tiny baby. There is some little, teeny, tiny promise. Some little, teeny, tiny call from God. Some teeny, tiny, little flicker of hope and light in your life right now. And you are faced with the decision this morning. God, I know how to make that flame grow. I know that the perfect job, so if you'll give it to me, that'll work. The perfect baby, the perfect boyfriend, the perfect husband, wife, girlfriend, the perfect everything, that will make it grow. And that God is saying to you this morning, I come in unexpected ways. And every piece, every piece, of your story, every piece of your story will help the world be saved from the things that threaten to destroy us. Because God so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son so that the things that threaten to destroy us the moments where we think we are about to perish, they don't have more power than the eternal and everlasting light of God. This morning, God is ready to give you what you need. I believe there's someone in this room this morning who it's been a really long time since you've trusted God since you've followed Jesus, since you've trusted that Jesus and believing in him and his power is actually what you need. Maybe there's somebody in this room who's never believed that before in their lives. In just a few minutes, I'm going to be at the back of the room, and I hope you'll come and you'll pray with me. Because believing in him will change everything. There's somebody who's facing a diagnosis or a job termination or a breakup or whatever, and you are going to, you are, are desperate for God's hope and love to show up in unexpected ways. And I want to pray with you this morning for that to happen. This, this is what I cling to more than anything in the whole world. That the light of the world, Jesus, was given to us because God loved us and he's ready to save us. And this is the, this is the deal, people. Our Advent series is called Light It Up. 
When Jesus lights your life up, plans that flame in your life, when he gives you what it is in unexpected ways that you actually needed, you don't get to hoard it. Okay, you don't get to hold on to that light. You don't get to hide it behind a bushel. Anybody sang that song before? You got to share it with the world desperate for it. There's somebody who needs to hear your story of God showing up in unexpected ways in your life. There is somebody who needs you to use your hand and your feet to show up in unexpected places to make the love of Jesus real. There is some coworker or some friend that expects you to be the last person in the world to show love and goodness. And you, my friends... You, my friends, are called to light it up because you, you and what Jesus is and has done through your life is what somebody else needs and they don't even know it right now. Can I get an amen? Open those hands up again and I'm going to pray over you. And then the band, uh, Chris is going to come and lead us in communion. God, for these open hands, I pray. May they be a symbol of us giving up our own need to control and think we know exactly what it is we need in our lives. And may they be a prayer to you this morning that we trust you to give us what it is we actually need. And we pray, God, with these open hands and these open hearts and these open lives, God, that you will use every story, every inch of every story in this room to bring glory and goodness to your world. Use these hands and these feet and these bodies and these hearts and these souls to light it up in a dark and desperate world. Amen.